Welcome to our educational video. This video has been developed by MedNav. MedNav is an organization that helps to promote women's and children's health worldwide through education and innovation. If you'd like to know more about our work or indeed support us, please visit this website link. In this video, we will review postpartum hemorrhage, the definition, the causes, medical treatments, and then focus in on compression and tamponade as ways to avoid hysterectomy in the extreme postpartum hemorrhage. Hemorrhage is one of the major killers of women globally, and the WHO say that 25% of all maternal mortalities are due to hemorrhage. The majority of these will happen in the austere environment. Most of these deaths are preventable in well-staffed, well-stocked units. The definition of postpartum hemorrhage is over 500 mils of blood loss following a normal delivery or a litre following caesarean section. The causes of primary PPH are divided into the four T's, tone, tissue, trauma, and thrombin. Tone accounts for 90% of cases when the uterus fails to contract after delivery of the placenta, meaning the failure of the contraction of maternal blood vessels in the placental bed. Trauma related to delivery this can be perineal, vaginal, cervical, and even uterine tears. Tissue is when a cotyledon of the placenta or membranes are left within the uterine cavity. Again, this inhibits the contraction of the uterus. The fourth T is thrombin, those with pre-existing coagulopathies or an acquired coagulopathy such as DIC after excessive blood loss or abruption. Uterine atony will also become a consequence of excessive bleeding from all other causes of PPH. The initial management of an atonic uterus is medical, but a postpartum hemorrhage is an obstetric emergency, so should be managed in terms of airway, breathing and circulation with appropriate resuscitation. A urinary catheter is a key intervention in an atonic PPH, as a distended bladder will inhibit the contraction of the uterus and therefore bleeding will not stop. Drugs used in hemorrhage are as follows. Oxytocin, which is also known as syntocinon or pitocin, ergometrin, which must not be used in those that are hypertensive, syntometrin is a combination of ergometrin and oxytocin, so again can't be used in hypertensive patients. Misoprostol has the benefit of being able to be administered PR and hemabate, or carboprost, which should be used in caution with those that are asthmatic. Tissue remaining in the uterus will cause PPH and must be removed to treat hemorrhage and allow uterine contraction. The placenta will need to be removed if it's not delivered spontaneously 30 minutes after delivery. For manual removal of the placenta, ensure the woman is consented, has IV access, adequate anaesthetic, antibiotic cover, and the bladder is empty. Insert a cupped hand into the vagina and follow the umbilical cord to reach the placenta within the uterus. Place your left hand on the fundus of the uterus and keeping the fingers of the right hand tightly together, find the plane between the placenta and the uterine wall and gently detach the placenta from the placental bed by bringing your closed fingers towards you. Once the whole placenta is detached, remove it through the vagina using your left hand to guard the uterus and prevent uterine inversion. Check the cavity is empty and cover the procedure with antibiotics and uterotonics. This simple and very effective intervention can prevent women from becoming unstable in postpartum hemorrhage. Insert a cupped hand into the vagina and form a fist in the anterior fornix. With your left hand on the patient's abdomen, compress the uterus between the two hands to compress the bleeding placental bed. If the patient requires further intervention, the next stage is operative with either compression sutures or balloon tamponade. There are many different types of balloon tamponade available. The Bacri or Cook's balloon, and even the Sengstack and Blakemore tube. These have been designed especially for uterine tamponade. With these balloons, you fill between two and 500 mils of water into the balloon to provide compression on the placental bed bleeding. These can be used if resources permit, but a cheap available alternative is the condom catheter. 
For this procedure, we require a condom, a Foley catheter, which will need to be spigoted either with a spigot or a clamp. And you'll also require some Vicor ties. Insert the catheter into the condom. Tie the catheter in place. You need to ensure that you do not tie the tie too tight as this will compress the lumen of the catheter. Gently insert the condom into the uterus, ensuring it is completely within the uterine cavity, and then fill the catheter with fluid. As the condom fills with fluid, it will compress the uterine bleeding and the placental bed in a similar fashion to the available uterine balloon tamponades. The available balloon tamponades take between two and 500 mils of water, but the condom will take much more. There will be some leaking of fluid. You'll then need to spigot the catheter. As I say, you can use a spigot or even a clamp. To keep the condom catheter in place, you'll need a vaginal pack. And these can stay in situ for between six and 24 hours. Whilst the condom catheter and pack are in situ, you must cover with IV antibiotics. After between six and 24 hours, you can gently deflate the condom catheter and monitor for any signs of blood loss. Uterine brace sutures can be used to provide mechanical compression of the uterus at laparotomy. For brace sutures, you will need an absorbable suture with a large needle, such as a Vicrol 3931. This has a 65 millimeter, 38 circle needle. Most obstetricians would use a brace suture after a balloon had failed following a normal delivery. They may use it sooner at caesarean section as the abdomen is already open. There are two types of brace suture, the B. Lynch or the Heyman suture. The Heyman is used following a normal delivery and the B. Lynch is used at caesarean section. Insert the suture three centimetres below the incision line and make it come out three centimetres above. Take the suture over the fundus of the uterus to the posterior uterus and insert a horizontal suture in the lower segment of the posterior uterus. Take the suture back over the fundus of the uterus and insert the suture again three centimetres above the incision and then to come out three centimetres below. Use your assistant to compress the uterus and tie your surgical knot. For the Heyman suture, you insert the suture in the lower uterine segment. Bring the suture back over the uterus and secure it with a clip. Place another suture, again at the lower segment but on the other side. Use your assistant to compress the uterus. And tie both sutures. If you're inserting a brace suture after a balloon has been tried, you will almost certainly break the balloon. So it is worth putting a brace suture in first if you're going to use both techniques. It's important to remember to use an absorbable suture, as non-absorbable sutures for brace sutures have been associated with bowel herniation and ischemia. The use of these techniques, balloon tamponades and compression sutures, can reduce the need for hysterectomies in postpartum haemorrhage. In fact, in up to 90% of cases, you will avoid the need for a hysterectomy.